Well, instead of going out to the car today and preaching, Debbie has turned the couch around for me and we tried to get the light where it would at least be acceptable. And I believe I'm going to preach in the motel room, sitting here on this couch, if that's what you call it. Hope you got your Bible handy. I got my copy of the Word of God. And I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 13 again. That's where we were. In fact, uh, that's where we were yesterday. And uh, it is uh, it is the uh, recording of the beginning of the first missionary journey. That's what it's come to be called. The first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. We made our way yesterday, working our way through the chapter up to verse 13. Let me read it. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos. If you recall, Paphos is the city down in Cyprus where Sergius Paulus, the governor, the deputy, got saved. Hallelujah. It's also where there's a blind man, a sorcerer, named Bar-Jesus or Elimus, groping, can't see, hoping somebody will lead him by the hand. God sure made his impact in Paphos. Hallelujah. You preach the word of God, something will happen. You scatter the seed, some of it's going to fall. <laughs> Glory to God on good ground. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came, they came to Perga. We're going to talk about Perga in a minute. But notice the wording there. It is extremely interesting. Paul and his company. I don't think I even heard the word Barnabas. Paul and his company. And yet, in chapter 13, it was Barnabas first and then Saul. Barnabas is the one giving credit. He is the one when Saul first went to Jerusalem, the believers were afraid of him. They said he, he's a killer. He has persecuted. And Barnabas said, now you can trust him. I've been around him. We studied this already. He genuinely got saved. Barnabas spoke up for him. About 10 years later, Saul has gone down to Cilicia to Tarsus, his hometown. He's a preaching the word of God uh, 90 miles an hour down there. People no doubt getting saved. And there's a church, a Gentile church named the church at Antioch. Antioch in Syria. And they don't have anybody to teach them the word of God. And Barnabas, this bar, he says, I'm going hundreds of miles. I'm going to go find Saul. I'm bringing him up here. He's the best Bible teacher I know. And they work there a year, a little better before they go on. This Barnabas, 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 Barnabas. And now all of a sudden, Paul and his company, no longer calling him Saul. Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is his Roman name. It is his Gentile name. And God did call him to be a preacher under the Gentile. Paul and his company. Oh, that is, that is a tremendous change of emphasis. Not Barnabas and Saul, Paul and his company. It's the, we're seeing the ascendancy, not self-promoted, of Paul, the leading figure in the Gentile church now for years to come. And we're seeing Barnabas recede somewhat into the background. You know what? Always in God's work, I'll need an amen. There's got to be a leader. Got to be somebody in the forefront. Jesus is called in the book of Hebrews the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, the word author means line leader. Ah, he's up front. He's, uh, he's already in glory. He's already seated at the Father's right. I'm glad I got a leader today with a capital L. That's Jesus. But here now, Paul will become the leader. He might have become the leader because he had the initiative and cast a, 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 a spell or put blindness on that old sorcerer, that old fortune teller uh, back down there in Cyprus. 
Paul, the leader, boy, he sure had leadership characteristics. Just like John the Baptist stepped into the background when Jesus came. Just like Elijah steps into the background. In fact, he's called to heaven and Elisha goes about doing good. God works that way with man. He'll use one man. He'll use another man. Then he'll use a third man, some in ascendancy, some backing up. Then the back, uh, uh, But hallelujah, the work goes on. The work goes on. Paul and his company. This is not a big crowd. As far as we know, all that is with Paul and his company is Barnabas and a young man named John Mark. Three, and yet it's called a company. Hallelujah. Could I announce, Jesus said it, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. It's a small company, but it is a company. Two or three can do a mighty work. Little is much when God is in it. Paul and his company. Let me say this too. I find it interesting Paul always has fellow believers around him. You will seldom see Paul by himself. I can think, and we're going to be studying it in a, uh, next week, week after, whenever we get uh, that far into Athens. He was in Athens alone. He wouldn't have been in Athens alone, but because of persecution, because uh, the people were trying to kill him, the disciples, his fellow workers sent him on to Athens. He was beside himself and his spirit was stirred. He's pacing the streets. Paul does not work his best alone. He's got to have somebody around him. And he is a, oh my, indeed, my Bible fell. Let me pick it up. He is indeed a people person. God did not mean the Christian life to be lived alone. God doesn't have any lone rangers. God wants us to live in harmony. God wants us to live as a family. God wants us to live not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Paul and his company. Those of you that are really Bible students, you enjoy reading that. Uh, let me... I came across a book years ago. I don't even know if you can still get it, but used book sources might find you. Personalities Around Paul. That was the name of it. Persona those that helped him on the first journey, those that helped him on the second journey, co-workers on the third journey, those that went with him to Jerusalem when he was arrested, uh, those that, uh, that were, followed him to Rome and were assisting him there. Paul, personalities, around Paul. There are numerous books on Paul and his co-workers. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they're going by ship. Well, you can't walk across the Mediterranean. They're going by ship. And they come to a place called Perga. P-E-R-G-A. It means earthy. Of the earth. And it was a worldly place. That ship ride 150 plus miles sailing out through the wild ocean and not a, a not a steam engine aboard not a diesel uh, simply with the sails hoisted and trusting the wind to get them to their destination that took skill they sailed up to Perga Perga as I said means of the earth Perga is a coastal city but not completely. It's about 12 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. There is a river that goes from the Mediterranean up to Perga and this ship might have been able to navigate. They may have stepped off right there in the city. Otherwise they disembarked down at the port and then they walked those 12 miles. They have come to Perga. Oh my known for its worship of the heathen goddess Diana. I would describe her, but I hesitate to do it in mixed company. She is the goddess of love. She is the goddess of sex. She is the goddess of promiscuity. Uh, she is, and yet she is a god who is worshipped uh, 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 extremely by those of the heathen world. Oh, 
Perga is located in Pamphylia. Like, uh, like Chattanooga is in Tennessee, Perga was in Pamphylia. Pamphylia is the larger area. It is the district. And again, rough, wild country. Gentiles who probably have never even heard for the most part the name of Jesus Christ. Paul is drawn to those hard situations. They're having revival down in Cyprus. Why doesn't he stay down there? His goal is to preach Christ in unknown places, to preach Christ where his name has never been spoken. And so we're off to Perga. Now, Luke does not tell us of any preaching Paul does in Perga. In fact, they come to Perga, probably get their breath, so to speak, and they're off to uh, other territories further inland. But when they come back to this area, Luke specifies they preached the word of God at Perga. And I might happen to add, when you preach the word, somebody say amen, something's going to happen. It'll never return void. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the engrafted word. It'll get in somebody's heart and like seed on good soil, something will germinate. Somebody will get born again. Oh, oh, I, 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 I'm still in, in this first verse. When they got to Perga, John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. <laughs> there are only three in this traveling group, this evangelistic team, and one of them is leaving, departing back to Jerusalem. His name is John. He is the youngest member of the team, of the company, and now for some reason, and Luke does not explain it, and the textbooks, the commentators only guess at it, nobody knows for sure. He decides he's going home. See y'all later. I'm going back to the house. Acts 15 says that he left them, he deserted them while they were in the middle of their great preaching tour. John, wonder why he went back. And I've tried to allow in our evening meditation a few minutes that I could talk with you about why John may have gone back. Here's one reason. And it gets a lot of Christian workers, and I'm afraid it takes its toll among missionaries. He might have got homesick. He lives in Jerusalem, that much we know. We know the name of his mother. Her name is Mary. And we know that she lives in a big house. Big enough that 120 people can meet in her upper room. That's where they were on the day of Pentecost. When Peter got out of jail miraculously, remember we studied it back in Acts 12, uh, when the angel left him, he walked through the street and went straight to Mary's house because he knew the church, the church would be there praying. And they were. John might have begun to miss the lavish meals. Mary had servants because one named Rhoda answered the door that day when Peter was pounding on it to gain access. He's a wanted man, you know. He might have missed the comforts. He might have missed somebody bathing his feet at night. He might have missed that comfortable bed in which he slept. He may have just gotten homesick and wanted to see Mama. By the way, I'll quote what Jesus said, He that puts his hands to the plow and turns back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. John Mark becomes for a while an unprofitable servant. He turned back. And if you don't know it by now, Paul does not like deserters. Paul does not care for quitters. Here's another reason he may have gone back. And I read it again this morning, studying and preparing. The journey they're beginning to take, Perga in Pamphylia, going up to a wild place called Antioch, not Antioch of Syria, semi-civilized, Antioch of Pisidia, heathen, I mean wild men up there. Very dangerous. And I read a minute ago that the road going up through there with it, Paul is absolutely headstrong. He's going to take it. He's going to preach a gospel up there. 
is loaded with thieves, robbers. If you don't give them what they want, they might kill you. I also read that there are times when malaria rages in that area, in that climate. John Mark might have just got scared. If you'll let me use a term we used in grammar school, he may have chickened out. God's work is no place for the weak-hearted. He may have said, I don't want malaria. I hear you never really fully get over it. I don't want to get robbed. And, and, uh, and I, I, I think I'm a little bit afraid. It, it may have been that. Either way, I remember what Proverbs 28, 1 said, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Little John, he's young. Give him time. He'll grow in grace. Here's another reason he may have turned around. Barnabas is related to John Mark. We learned that from Colossians. Sister's son. Mark is sister's son to Barnabas. I take that to be his nephew. Some of the Greek scholars say, well, it could be a cousin. or Sister's son means sister's son to me. And Uncle Barnabas John may have thought has been done wrong. Uncle Barnabas is older, probably. Uncle Barnabas is the senior member of this traveling team, and all of a sudden it's no longer Barnabas and Saul, or Bar it's Paul. Paul's taken over. Paul's a running this thing. Paul is in charge, and I resent uh, my uncle not being. Could have been hurt feelings. Oh, I think I'll preach that a minute. That wouldn't be the first time hurt feelings interrupted God's work. I'm taking up an offense for my uncle. He's been done wrong, and he's a gracious man. He won't stand up to that bullheaded Saul, but, but, but I, I'm going back. I'm, I'm done. I, I'm not going to work under him. Hurt feelings. Oh, that we would ask God. To go. I, I know an old preacher years ago. I was just in high school, and I heard him preach again and again and again. He'd pray this, God, uh, give me thick skin. Give me skin as thick as an elephant that I'll not be easily offended and easily hurt. Boy, this, we need some thick-skinned Baptists in our churches. People get hurt over the silliest little things now. And I mean quit going to church because of it. We don't know for sure. What, and it could have been this. Now we're going into well, at Antioch, and, and it'll come up if I ever get to tonight's verses. It'll come up in a few minutes. Paul would go to this, preach to the Jews, what few Jews were there. He'd talk to them first, but most of the time the Jews rejected him and would not hear him, and Paul would go straight to the Gentiles. He'd start telling those uncircumcised Gentile dogs in the eyes of a Jew, Gentile dogs about Jesus. John and notice Luke only uses his Jewish name, his Hebrew name here. He might have said, I can't put up with that. I can preach to the Jews. I can tell the Jews about Jesus. I can even tell the Jews they don't have to get circumcised. I can tell the Jews that, uh, that Jesus is the son, but not them fifth. He may have gone back on a policy disagreement. He may not have loved the Gentiles like Paul loved the Gentiles. Either way, he's gone back home and this will become a source of great contention when we get to Acts 15 Paul and Barnabas will have words yeah sharp disagreement over John Mark and his deserting them on the trail John Mark departing went back to Jerusalem verse 14 verse 14 but when they departed, and that can only be Barnabas and Paul now, excuse me, Paul and Barnabas now, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch. They came to Antioch. That's that city in Pisidia. Pisidian Antioch. Pamphylia to the south. Get a little further north, Pisidia. All very rough areas going up there to Antioch, named after a ruler named Antiochus, gone up to Antioch, anti, a -N -T, it's the Greek word against. These boys are against everything. And they'll be against Paul, and they'll be against Jesus when they first hear. They went up to Antioch, 
in Pisidia. That is another distance of 80, 100 miles, and they will walk through those dangerous territories all the way. Mm. They came up to Antioch in Pisidia, and they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. I need to be right here, right now. Let me tell you. And, and this becomes Paul's policy. Here is Paul's procedure. Here is Paul's pattern. He'll go into a Gentile city. And if they have a synagogue, if there would be no synagogue in a city unless there were at least 10 Jewish men, adult males, that many, 10, are required to make a quorum to be able to uh, organize a synagogue. Paul said there's a synagogue here. There's at least a handful of Jews in Antioch. Uh, Barnabas, we're going there on the Sabbath day. Don't y'all don't notice now. He didn't say we're going down there Sunday and I'm going to preach to them. They wouldn't have been there on Sunday. Not on the Lord's day. Jews worship on the Sabbath, the seventh day, the last day of the week. We're going up there. We're going in that synagogue. Oh, I mean, Paul's a Jew. He can get access there. And plus, Gentiles could come if they swore a certain degree of allegiance. And, and uh, I'll cover that in a minute. And uh, we're going up there and we're going to sit down. And, and that means they will listen to the morning prayer. That means they will listen to the chief ruler of the synagogue read a selected part. They're going to go. They don't believe like the Jews believe. They believe Jesus is God. Jesus is the Savior. The Jews reject it, but they're going up there. Why is Paul doing that? To get the ear, to be able to preach to these Jews the Lord Jesus Christ. This can be abused, but if you heard the old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans without sinning, without violating a moral standard of God. That's exactly what Paul is doing. He goes to that synagogue. He sits down. I guarantee you he's wearing his prayer shawl and he'll participate. He'll say the Shema, the Lord God is one. He'll, he'll participate in that morning prayer. He'll nod and say amen uh, as the chief rabbi says some things. But all he's up to, he's not being a hypocrite. I'm not implying that. All he's up to is an opportunity to say a few words in the meeting that Sabbath day, and they sat down in the synagogue. Verse 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the Jews would read through the Old Testament in order the law, books of Moses, and the prophets, both, how would we say it, major and minor. And uh, after that, Jesus in, in, in Luke chapter 4, he went into his hometown synagogue, Nazareth, where he was reared, and uh, he sat down, and they read the scripture they happened to be reading that day from Isaiah 61, talking about the Messiah, the Spirit of God is upon me. In fact, the rabbi didn't read it. He, 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 Jesus, you, sir, you're, you're a rabbi, you're a young aspiring Jew, come up here and read, and he let him read, and, and the Spirit of God is upon me. God hath anointed me to preach the gospel. It's the Messiah. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jesus said, this day has this been fulfilled. In your... And they got mad at him and tried to kill him on the spot, tried to push him over the cliff. Luke, Luke 4, you can go read it. Jesus was invited to say some words that day. And that's exactly, that's exactly what's going to happen. To Paul. They have read the scripture. They have read uh, uh, the word of God and the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them. Paul and Barnabas sent unto them saying, men, brethren, men is on there, uh, the male of the species. Ladies could not speak. Ye men, and brethren, and by that, they don't mean born again brethren, they mean fellow Jews. We can tell, ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation, you boys got anything to say, any word of encouragement for the people, for your fellow uh, uh, Jews here, uh, any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Oh, I love that. Say on using the verbal ego. 
Let your mind speak. Use your logic. Expound the scripture we've read or, or use some illustrations elsewhere from the Old Testament, which I think is what Paul did. And, and, uh, and you speak. You, you talk here. Say on. Well, you don't tell Paul to say on without sitting down and letting that boy say on a while. Reminds me of that verse in Psalm 107. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Paul's going to get to say something. Oh, he's excited. <laughs> We're in a Gentile city. Uh, there are enough Jews to have a quorum to have this little synagogue. But say on, say on. Oh, what an open door. Paul's thrilled. Then Paul, verse 16, and our last verse for today. I'm not going to cover the sermon. The sermon starts tomorrow. We'll look at that great sermon then. God willing, tomorrow night. Then Paul stood up. He's been sitting. That's the posture for a synagogue. Then he stood up. If you want to go back and look in Luke 4, when Jesus preached that great sermon from Isaiah 61 that day, Jesus was sitting. He sat. They brought him the scroll. And he read. But now, the Old Testament folks sat. In every synagogue, there was carved out of rock something called the seat of Moses. That's where the man would sit, the chief ruler of the synagogue, uh, the, uh, the rabbi in charge that day. He would sit in the seat of Moses and teach. Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, he sat and he taught them. Paul stands up. It's the beginning of a new era. It is the beginning of a new program. Go to the synagogues. Tell them about Jesus. Stand up. Oh my, oh my. We are to be standing up for God. We're not to depart. That's why we have pulpits partly. To stand and proclaim the good word of God. Last verse there, 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand. That is a cute word there. An interesting word, beckoning. It means to wave back and forth. It means to totter. Y'all, I can see him now. Y'all. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak for a while now. They've authorized me, they, and I want you all to listen. And oh, what a sermon he's gonna preach! He's gonna tell Jews how to get saved. He's gonna tell them about. Uh, can I tell you this? And and uh, if I repeat it tomorrow night, just bear with me because there'll be people watching tomorrow night that did not watch uh, uh, this particular meditation. The sermon he's about to preach. Oh, I hope I get an amen. It is modeled along the line of Stephen's sermon the day Stephen died. You know where Paul learned to preach? <laughs> he looked at that dying saint who would not curse, who would not be bitter, who in fact prayed, Lord, they're killing me, but lay not this sin to their charge. He heard that sermon from that dying saint. He never got over it. Part of the pricks against me through his uh, kicking. Uh, God used that sermon to put him under Holy Ghost conviction. I think he saw Stephen, Lord Jesus, I see you. I see you standing. <laughs> I see you standing. And uh, uh, would you receive my spirit? I'm dying. Would you receive? He preached a sermon along the line of the sermon Stephen preached that day. Oh, my. We better realize somebody's looking. Somebody's watching. Somebody's got an eye on how we're living our Christian life and they'll probably model something after the way, do it right, after the way we do it. He waved with his hand and he said, men of Israel, men of Israel. Now, usually there was a small section of the synagogue where the ladies could sit I do not know if the ladies were in attendance that day. Normally they would be, but he particularly addresses it to the men. This is not feminine in any way at all. Men, a nair, the male of the species, men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. What's that, Ann? Ye men of Israel, synagogue's got some Jews in it, and ye that fear God. Let me tell you who they are. They are Gentiles who have heard about the God of Abraham. They are Gentiles. They're not willing to be circumcised. 
They are not willing to eat by the dietary laws of Moses. They like shrimp and pork chops and hot dogs. They're not willing to obey all 613 laws of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy. But they do want to hear. They will be reverent. They will be respectful. They've got a love for God. They've got a love for morality. They've got a love for God-fearers. Is the name Luke uses. Watch. He waves his hand, men of Israel. I want every one of you, my Jewish brethren, to hear what I'm about to say. Paul's about to preach something radical, revolutionary. He's about to preach Jesus, 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 death, burial, resurrection. Hallelujah. Not just you Jews. You God. I see you sitting over there. You've not dressed exactly like our brethren. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I passed one of you coming in. You, you, your breath gives you away. You've eaten some unclean food today. I know. But you are interested in God. You are concerned enough to come to the synagogue and learn about God. I'm preaching to you too. Jews and Gentiles. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Jesus came unto his own. The Jews didn't receive him. They rejected him. Crucified him. Then he turned, but as many as would receive him. To them, them dirty Gentiles, would he give the power to become the son? I love John 1, 12. It's how I got in. Hallelujah to God. I am a Gentile saved by God's marvelous grace. Well, that's it. Verses 13 through 16. Paul standing up to preach. I can't wait till tomorrow. We're going to analyze his sermon. But in what I've said tonight, what has stood out, more and more of you are interacting with me. Preacher, that what you said about John Mark, I'm a wondering. It, 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 it sort of scared me. It made me want to be careful in my Christian life. Uh, uh, preacher, what you said about their traveling, I admire their tenacity. And, and I didn't know it was a malaria infection. And I didn't, what verse or what aspect of our time together has God used to teach you and to impress your heart? Now it's prayer time. I think before I pray, I've got time to do it. I'll tell you how I came up with what I believe God brought my Bible again, falls off the couch. What I believe is God's plan for our prayer time today. We learned yesterday when men first began to call on the name of the Lord. And then we don't see prayer per se by name for quite a while. But I came across something. I came across something. I'll quote the verse. And Enoch walked with God. And Enoch, a holy man, a righteous man, walked with God. I'm of this opinion. If you walk with God, get me an amen. You're going to talk with God. And you know what it's called when you're talking with God? It is called prayer. Enoch walked with God. A few chapters later, I read this. And Noah walked with God. Genesis 5, 22. Enoch walked with God. Genesis 6, in fact, the next chapter, Noah walked with God. And then Amos adds this, and we're going to pray. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? Can two walk together, except they, and that verb to be agreed, unless they assemble, unless they fellowship, unless they commune. So now, I have found praying early in the Old Testament. Enoch was a man of prayer. Noah was a man of prayer. They came together and they communed. They fellowshiped with Almighty God. Prayer as communion with God. Prayer as fellowship with God. Heavenly Father, we're bowing our heads, closing our eyes, asking you one more time, teach us something 
from the school of prayer. Lord, would you teach me that praying is not just asking for things. That's illegal. Ask and it'll be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it'll be opened unto you. You have not called you. Lord, it is okay to come and ask you for things. But teach us tonight. I pray tonight you will imbue this, this truth into our hearts that prayer is communion with you too. Lord, help us to take 10 minutes tonight in prayer or five minutes tonight in prayer. Or Lord, busy, busy schedule. Shame on me for even saying it. Two minutes in prayer and commune with you. Lord, I know you're there. Make yourself real. Let me feel the warmth of your presence. Lord, I'm praying that for Brother Bagel, but I'm praying it for every lady listening, every man who is watching God, help us to get over quickly our asking time and then just bask in prayer in the sunlight of your love, your grace, and your goodness. Jesus said something about if we'll abide in him. Lord, in prayer, teach us to abide in you, to enjoy time with you. And in so doing, we will walk with God. Oh, Lord, I realize I realize that part of prayer, part of prayer is thanksgiving. And oh Lord, we're taught in everything to get, and in every prayer, help us to do it, Lord. Help us to include some thanksgiving. Thank you for letting me preach today. Thank you for a dry motel room with a, a hurricane that went by. Uh, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. But Lord, teach me also to pray after the thankfulness has been completed and after the request of me, just to love you just to kiss you, just to commune with you, just to snuggle up under your wings real close. Teach us the aspect of communing with you in prayer. And then, Lord, I'm reminded, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Lord, I can't be on my knees all day. I've got to work. Lord, I can't. Lord, teach me then in a, Five second interval of time, I can snuggle up to you, love you, and prayerfully commune with you. And if I do that at the lunch break, and if I do that driving home, and if I do that right before I eat supper, and if I do that right before I go into church, if I do that right when I get, I will be walking with you, communing with you. Teach me to turn minutes and seconds in the holy time of loving you. Lord, here's my prayer. Teach us to commune with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I go off the air, I've got to tell you something. I read George Mueller's biography. I've read it several times. And uh, I'm impressed by this fact. Mueller read the Word of God over and over and over, all the way through, hundreds of times. But his biographer says, over 200 times, George Mueller read the Bible on his knees. Prayer on his knees. He was reading the Bible, studying the Bible, talking the Bible to Almighty God. Steal away tonight. Get you a verse of scripture and pray it. Commune with the Lord using his own language. That's prayer as walking with God. Brother Bagwell saying I'm looking forward to tomorrow night the sermon at Antioch of Pisidia, a model of evangelistic preaching. Talk to me. If you can't say anything else, say watched or watching. The ED I like better. It means you completed it. Which verse, which thought are you going to be chewing on for a little while to come? Brother Bagwell, God bless you.